Hi, welcome to Well Traveled Life with Jonathan and Jennifer. This week we are headed to Glasgow. I think it'd be good to kind of give folks uh, who maybe haven't seen all the videos a little bit of a um, heads up how we got to be at, at this point of our trip. Uh, we landed, we flew into London, and our, our plan was essentially to, to take a dash, just go from England to Scotland to really begin our trip. So that first night we flew into London, the airport. We drove to the Oxford area. We spent the night and part of the next day there. Then we drove to in, into Oxford, and I think you saw a little bit of that in our video as well. Then we uh, drove up to a town in between uh, Liverpool and Manchester. Well, the big city is Warrington, but we were in Appleton Thorn, which is the small village. Okay. And that was the subject of a video that we did. The next day we left and we drove up to the Lake District in a small hamlet called uh, Chapels. And that's, uh, that's also the subject of, of a video. We spent uh, two or three days there with John and Helen. Uh, went to a couple of magnificent pubs, did some hiking. So hope, hopefully you've watched that video because it, uh, it's a great one. One of the reasons that we made these stops from England is we had mapped out our course ahead of time and we were really looking at trying to reduce driving to not more to, than three to three and a half hours per day. So each of these stops gave us a manageable amount of driving time but also allowed for us to enjoy the locations where we were going. So it was a little bit of a dash to Glasgow but it was a slow dash. We were in some ways trying to get used to one driving a new car, a new, at least older car, but it was Tesla, driving on the other side of the highway, getting used to the navigation system, uh, charging the vehicle. So really, that, that was kind of the plan, to kind of break the days up, break up that distance. That we probably could have driven in one day, but we would have been exhausted. But get used to the car, do a little bit of exploring. We certainly did that. We knew we were going to be coming back to that area. We drove to Glasgow, uh, stopped at the airport, picked up a friend, Tammy, who was coming to spend the next month with us. Tammy had never been to Europe before. Drove to uh, an Airbnb uh, just south of uh, Glasgow that we were going to be staying at with David, and that'll be a separate video magnificent house and really great house great, great house and the day we're about to see in this video is uh, the three of us are going into Glasgow we're taking uh, a light rail train into Glasgow the main station and we're meeting up with a friend of ours uh, Justin who was a guide that we had actually met the year before who had given us a tour and the Edinburgh area, St. Andrews, and a bunch of small towns. He'd become a great friend, and he had agreed to meet us there. He brought along a friend. Yeah, we fell in love with Christian. And so that's, that's what you're about to see. We're going to be walking around Glasgow, visiting universities, restaurants, pubs, museums, meeting his friend, taking the subway there. And we think this is a video you're going to really enjoy. I think what's special about this particular video and the day that we were there, Glasgow was host to the largest bike race in the world. And that was going on the day we were there. So you'll see some bike racing footage in here. But it meant that parts of the city were completely closed off. So some of the things that we would normally be showing you were showing a little bit from a distance just because they had the area completely closed off for the bike route. Jennifer and I have, have both been to Glasgow before, not together, but uh, you know, several decades ago. And we, we certainly had uh, expectations of what the city was gonna be like and maybe some basic feelings about it. We're not uh, big fans of big cities and Glas Glasgow's a pretty good city, I guess, the largest mm -hmm. uh, in Scotland. But we, we thought of it I think in our minds is it's kind of an industrial town and kind of the business side side of 
and uh, Scotland, maybe Chicago to New York, you know, Scotland's version of that, maybe. We found it uh, a really delightful town. Lots of great restaurants, museums, a uh, number of universities there, a couple of big ones, and so a lot of students, a lot of culture, vibrant nightlife, and uh, a great city to walk around in. And having the bike race there that day, uh, that really made it special as well. So Glasgow, my description would have been the gritty city. Yeah. Um, and as I was doing the planning and I ran it by Justin, who's from Edinburgh, and Justin was like, what? No Glasgow? It's my favorite city. You have to go to Glasgow. And I was like, meet me there and I'll do it. And so we're so fortunate to have gotten Justin to meet us there. So one thing about Glasgow that makes it special is the people. And the city's slogan is people make Glasgow because Glasgow people are salt of the earth kind of people, kind of random. You never know what's going to happen, but they're next level lovely people. We're not city people. Driving in a city is never fun. Driving in a foreign city is less fun. And so, as Jonathan said, we took the train in to avoid parking hassles and use the underground in our feet to get around the city. Enjoy our, this video and uh, we'll catch you on the back side. We took a 20 minute train from Paisley into the central station in Glasgow. We were able to pre-purchase our tickets online using ScotRail. And since much of the city center was covered up with the bike race, we ended up taking an M line, the underground, over to the West End, which is where a lot of what you kind of want to see as a tourist in Glasgow is. By the way, Glasgow has the third oldest subway in the world after London and Istanbul. So in the video today, we're going to cover George Square. We'll go to the Glasgow Botanic Garden. We'll head to University of Glasgow and we'll visit the Kelvin Grove Museum and Gallery. We stopped for lunch at a place Justin recommended because he knew we loved good Indian food. And this place did not disappoint unless you're Tammy and you don't like spicy food, then it might be a problem. Good food, local and international, is plentiful in Glasgow. That gritty city we remember was born of Glasgow's industrial history and the population influx after the Highland Clearings. Glasgow was a very heavily industrialized city. And iron and ships in the British Empire were built in Glasgow. So I don't want to say it became a very wealthy city, but most people didn't see the wealth, but it made a few people very wealthy. The merchants who were trading, um, and some of the street names are reflective of that. You have Jamaica Street, Virginia Street. A lot of it also, unfortunately, was on the backs of slaves and things like that too. So the sugar, yeah. Um, and so there's also like a, a kind of a tragic bit about that as well, and about the exploitation of slaves in the, in, in the colonies. Um, so the people kind of got their money in, in bad ways, but also even for the people here working in the mills and the plantations and things like that, they were also exploited and not paid very well. The Highland Clearances were the time in the Highlands when the landowners saw that the land was more valuable for grazing sheep rather than crofting. People were forced by the British government out of their homes and they gave people little to no warning. They just set their house on fire and they just had to flee. So Central Station over there, that bit of it is called the Highland Man's Umbrella because it's where the Highlanders would take shelter from the rain when they arrived in the city while they were looking for work. So Glasgow went from being a small town to a population exploding. Between, say, 1760 and 1820, the population just went crazy. And now it's the biggest city in Scotland and the third biggest city in the United Kingdom. To eschew our gritty city notions, the first stop we made was at the Glasgow Botanic Gardens. This is a large park area with lots of glass houses, the most famous being the Kibble Palace, which was deconstructed and reconstructed between 2004 and 2006, and now houses one of the plant collections, as well as a number of statues, a koi pond, and some other exhibits. With no entry fee, the garden is available to all who visit. Combining botanics, structures, architecture, sculpture, and history, the Glasgow Botanic Garden is a living room for the city. The 
Edinburgh and Glasgow are only an hour apart, but they are such different cities. It's always been a heavy industry city. Edinburgh never was industrial. Um, Edinburgh was always for legal services, um, printing, bookbinding. They have a brewery and there is a rivalry between the cities because the people are very different. Uh, here it's a bit more rough and ready, but that's what makes people so friendly. Edinburgh is a bit more posh so and refined. In the heart of the West End is another sign of Glasgow's progressiveness. A former church has been turned into Or and More, a really cool restaurant, private dining facility, theater, and venue area. This would be a great place for lunchtime theater, a good meal, or a special event. Between the Botanic Garden and the University, there's a special treat. We couldn't help but stop through Ashton Lane, which is this quaint cobbled street full of great shops and cafes. The River Clyde is the main river in Glasgow. It's the second largest in Scotland. But the River Kelvin is a tributary to it and dominates the landscape of this part of the city, making it really a natural, leafy, pretty part of the city. Some people think it's Patrick, but it's Partick, and uh, it's my favourite neighbourhood in the west end of Glasgow, so lots of great pubs, well there's one over there that's quite old, the three judges, but great food, um, lots of students, uh, it's a great, a great vibe here. We headed through town to get to the Kelvin Grove, which is both a museum and a gallery. Lord Kelvin has made his mark in Glasgow. You might have heard of like the Kelvin scale of temperature, absolute zero. So in Glasgow, it was a center for studying for medicine. Actually, at the university, they also have a museum called the Hunterian. Um, the Glasgow Coma Scale is used all over the world. It kind of tells you how deep somebody's coma is. There are a lot of medical advancements, innovation, and not just medical, but scientific as well. And Lord Kelvin was a big scientific genius. <laughs> The museum is located in Kevin Grove Park and is an architectural feast for the eyes. But inside, it is this incredible hodgepodge, if you will, of history, culture, science, nature. There are these tremendous exhibits, but you sometimes wonder how they're connected. And in order to get around and see what you want to see, your best bet is to use the maps with guides that show you where each of the exhibits are. Like the Botanic Garden, the museum is free to enter. There's no admission price. If you go Monday through Saturday, try to be there at one o'clock for the free organ recital or on Sunday at three o'clock. Take time to wander just to take in all of the different types of exhibits and kinds of art that are in the gallery in the museum. There's just such a plethora. But then you've got everything from Elvis Presley to the scientifically recreated face of Robert Burns. Check out exhibits as diverse as flying birds and flying airplanes. The Spitfire hangs above Sir Roger the Elephant, who toured the country from 1885 to 1897, pulling a small wagon from town to town as part of Bostock and Wombwell's menagerie before spending the rest of his life in the Scottish Zoo. Crofting Life and the Massacre at Glencoe are featured in famous artworks. But perhaps the most famous painting is by Salvador Dali, the Surrealist, in his interpretation of Christ of St. John of the Cross. With its depiction of Christ floating on the crucifix into the darkness above a dreamlike landscape below, minus the nails, the crown of thorns, the blood, or even the expression on his face. The 1951 painting is one of the most famous and controversial modern works of religious art. Not surprisingly, Dali said that the inspiration came to him in a series of dreams. He had a cosmic dream where he saw the image in color and it represented the nucleus of the atom, which he considered to be the very unity of the universe, the Christ. In 1961, a visitor attacked the painting with a stone and ripped the canvas with his hands. It has been repaired and you can hardly see the damage. The Scottish crown jewels are the oldest ones in Europe that are still in use. If you saw the coronation of the king recently, all, all the crown jewels they have in England are from the restoration of the monarchy, so the 1600s onwards. Oliver Cromwell uh, invaded Scotland and was looking for the crown jewels, but they were kept hidden by the minister's wife up in uh, Dunlough near Aberdeen and kept safe from him. Uh, and then they were locked away uh, because they were um, symbolic of 
Scotland's sovereignty. They were locked in a trunk uh, underneath Edinburgh Castle and discovered by Sir Walter Scott uh, just in time for George the Fourth's visit to Edinburgh and he was presented with them. George the Fourth's visit was such a big deal and uh, he was the first monarch to visit Scotland in 200 years. Queen Victoria fell in love with Scotland. She bought Balmoral Castle and built a bigger one there in a Scottish colonial style because the old castle was too small for her. And this started the tradition of the monarchs visiting Scotland. And because the Queen was spending so much time in Scotland, the wealthy Victorian people started wanting to know what the fuss was all about. And it also led to a renaissance of romanticizing historic figures like Mary Queen of Scots, um, William Wallace, and Bonnie Prince Charlie. Uh, and so those people became kind of talked about and, and, and literary figures again, um, especially by Sir Walter Scott. William Wallace's kilt-wearing warriors might be a myth. The kilts, not the warriors. The first of four International Glasgow exhibitions took place in 1888, and it was actually the opening of Kelvin Grove Park. It was a showcase of Glasgow, uh, Victorian Glasgow, the progress here, the Industrial Revolution, the shipbuilding, all of this, kind of show off Glasgow to the world. They had a number of exhibitions, one in 1901, one in 1911, and this one in 1888, and this is Queen Victoria here, surrounded by 253 people. But her personal life really got in the way. Um, her first marriage to the Dauphin of France was only a year long, and then he died, and then she married to Lord Darnley, and their marriage was unhappy, so she had a number of lovers, and then her husband was found dead, and a lot of people accused her of, of really plotting this murder, but. Um, yeah, and then also she was the wrong religion. She was Catholic during the Protestant Reformation. So there's a lot of things that really counted against her. Um, and she was imprisoned in Scotland for a year in a castle in Lochleven, and her supporters helped her escape. And she went to England because Elizabeth was her cousin, the Queen of England. And then she was imprisoned for about 19 years there and then beheaded in a plot that was kind of fabricated to implicate her of wanting to take the throne of Elizabeth. So she's very, very tragic. Um, but the people that liked her saw her as a very good queen who listened to her people and really cared. And very educated, very sporty, loved to play tennis. Um, quite an amazing woman, really. The Floating Heads exhibit is 50 individually designed heads, each with a different expression showing a different kind of an emotion that seemed to float in space. They were created by Sophie Cave, who made them to signify the diversity of human experience and the complexity of our emotions. You'll want to see them from below, but also go up to the second floor where you get a level view of them. The Calvin Grove is a marvel. Do not miss this. So according to the legend of the Slagacta Old Bridge, there was a warrior queen from Skye, and she went into a battle with a giant from Ireland. And the queen's daughter was really upset that her queenly mother was fighting this Irish giant. And so she cried into the river and she asked the fairies for help. Because in Iceland they have the elves, and in Ireland they have the leprechauns, in Scotland we have the fairies, are the, the creatures that help us. The fairies heard the princess and they caused smoke to come from the river, and it blinded the eyes of the giant. And when the smoke cleared, um, the princess invited him into the home. Hospitality is very important in the Gallic culture. And so she had, um, she had food and, and he became a guest. So then he couldn't go on fighting the mother. And now they say the water remained enchanted by the fairies. So if you put your face into the water under the bridge for seven seconds and let it dry off naturally, the fairies will bless you with eternal beauty. Hmm, I'd say those fairies are doing a good job. St. George's Tron Church sits on the corner of Nelson Mandela Place. During the apartheid in South Africa, the South African consulate was located here. The name of the square was changed so that when people wrote letters to the consulate, they would have to make note of Nelson Mandela and his plight in prison. Glasgow people really care about social justice, and that's just one example of it, is naming the street after Nelson Mandela when he was in prison to show their solidarity and to be against the apartheid. Nearby is George Square and the municipal chambers, flanked with monuments to Scotland's heroes, including Robert Burns, James Watt, Sir Robert Peel, and Sir Walter Scott, as well as Queen Victoria. Christian studied pastry making in Lisbon, so it only makes sense that we stopped here for traditional wild Scottish blueberry natas. It seems easy, it's very difficult to do that. You just have to push harder, otherwise you are going to bro, bro. Oh my god. I know. Really? I know. That crust is baked entirely in butter. 
<laughs> there is nothing but buttery, crispy, flaky, beautiful in this. As we headed to the university, Justin has a second home in Italy and a friend from Italy is actually a doctoral student working at the university and came to meet us and help with our tour there. Founded in 1450, Glasgow University is the fourth oldest university in the English speaking world. It is a public university known for its school of medicine and school of law, although you can study multiple things there. And while the school looks like the model for Hogwarts, it really was not used in the Harry Potter films. This is one of the most difficult schools to get into. It was exciting to be there on graduation day when students were getting out of it. Tammy will continue with us through Scotland and you'll also see Justin in a number of other Scottish cities. Sure. Thanks for joining us here today and we will see you on our next stop which is beginning the North Coast 500. We're going to do it from the east over to the west and so we will start in Pitlochry. Let's not put that in the video. We've only been here 20 minutes and he's already going after the English. <laughs> I think that's a theme in Scotland though, isn't it?